just uh, want to say in the light of so many things that are going on, I am proud to be an American. And how I thank God uh, for the freedom, the opportunities, and oh, it just gives me cold chills today. How thankful. And I have so looked forward uh, to this morning in a number of ways. One is for our patriotic celebration, but also we will come to a climactic conclusion of this incredible book of Habakkuk. And as I always say, as I go through a book, it becomes one of my favorites and Habakkuk's become one of my best friends over the last few months. And in one sense, I will kind of hate to say goodbye to Habakkuk, but uh, we will for a time and a season um, today. So as we turn our attention to this incredible book, I just wanted to start out with the word rejoice. Rejoice integrates with the knowledge of Christ the Lord. It integrates with our identification with him and it also uh, integrates with our trust in him and our praise in him. I wanted to read for us, which makes an incredible bridge to our proclamation, uh, something that uh, was recently brought to my attention in regards to our founders and in particular with John Hancock. When the Boston Massacre occurred, it was February 22nd in 1770. And obviously it just intensified a lot of tensions that were going on. After that date, there was an annual commemoration of the Boston Massacre. And they would have different people address or different people speak during that time. John Hancock was honored to give that address in 1774. And to me, I again am so amazed in the providence of God that as we would bring our Habakkuk study to a conclusion on July 4th, uh, how God put this all together. You just can't plan these things a lot of times. And I wanted to read for you, in the light of them having a good king, King George, and then the tyranny that came under King George III and created so many tensions, I wanted to read for you what was written by John Hancock in part. He said, I have the most animating confidence that the present noble struggle for liberty will terminate gloriously for America. And let us play the man for our God and for the cities of our God. Whilst we are using the means in our power, let us humbly commit our righteous cause to the great Lord of the universe, a Psalm 37, 5, who loveth righteousness and hateth iniquity, Hebrews 1, 9. And having secured the approbation of our hearts by a faithful and unwearied discharge of our duty to our country, let us joyfully leave our concerns in the hands of him, 1 Peter 5, 7, who raiseth up and pulleth down empires and kingdoms of this world as he pleases. Daniel 2, 21. And with cheerful submission to his sovereign will, from Job 22, 21, devoutly say, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield not meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet we will rejoice in the Lord. We will joy in the God of our salvation. And then this commentary. Significantly, John Hancock had chosen the passage from Habakkuk 3 as his final closing charge to the Bostonians. 
that passage was a strong admonition to keep their eyes focused on God and to leave the outcome to him that even if their livestock should become barren and their agriculture ravaged, thereby destroying their income and means of living, that regardless of what happened or how desperate the circumstances might become, yet we will rejoice in the Lord. We will joy in the God of our salvation. Let the faith of the Bostonians who found their joy in the Lord be an encouragement that when our eyes are fixed on him, who is the source of our joy, he who is king over everything can overrule our circumstances. Incredible, isn't it? Revealing so much of the heart, of the trust, of the faith, of the joy. And to me, as we celebrate July 4th, uh, that biggest name on the bottom of the Declaration of Independence is whose name? John Hancock. And that he would choose this book and these verses in this closing address that he had the privilege of giving in 1774 to me is so uh, providential in so many incredible ways. And that's exactly what we have here in Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19, a hymn a psalm of praise, uh, of faith in the Lord and hopeful rejoicing uh, in and of Him. So with that introduction, I want to invite you to go with me in the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures, whatever form or translation that you would choose, to the book of Habakkuk, and in particular to Habakkuk 3, verse 17. And we're going to conclude our pastoral expositional journey through what is called one of the most penetrating books in the Old Testament with a proclamation that we're entitling Habakkuk, the prophet's doxology. I don't, don't think I'm coming up. And there I go. So that's good. So. Uh, this is um, really an exclamation point onto this incredible book. Yesterday, I had the opportunity of talking with Bob Shine and uh, about Sherry and all that was kind of going on there. And I was just so reminded that it was Bob through Ed Miller who just brought me to such a point of understanding that as we come to God's word, uh, only God illumines God's revelation. So we come with total trust upon the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our understanding, to teach us, instruct us in such a way that we will be transformed and changed. And really that is my heartfelt prayer that as we go out today because of these last months in Habakkuk and just the work of the Holy Spirit, we'll just be ever increasingly conformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So I want to, if you will just bear with me, give us one final reset of Habakkuk uh, very quickly as it leads us to this climactic conclusion that we have here. The who of this incredible book is the professional prophet who possibly was a priest who was in Judah whose name was Habakkuk. The when that we have of this book is 605 or 607 BC, prior to the Babylonian captivity and the invasion that was going to happen. A time of international crisis and national corruption. The culture there was characterized by sin, lawlessness, rebellion towards God and independence from God and how we can relate to that and how relevant that is. The why of this book is first and foremost, I believe, to reveal to us God and his character. Specifically, and I just wanted to review these one last time, his sovereignty, his wisdom, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, his power, his mercy, his presence, his eternality, immutability, his majesty, his glory, his plan of discipline, of judgment, and 
and being faithful to his promises. How amazing that is packed in these three chapters. But then also it was written to encourage and stimulate a response of faith and trust in him and rejoicing. And I have just adopted for us as a correlating passage of scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, just to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge Him, and He's going to direct our paths. If we go forward in life with anything else, go forward with that and how applicable that has been for me over this past year. And the what is here, we have said that the theme is Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord, and all that embrace there. And also the topics here, I thought this morning the topics just kind of like orbit around him. And the topics are faith and righteousness and really honest questions of God and prayer and God revealing answers and promises and hope and encouragement. And we have praise and even we'll look in detail in this, this closing a few verses. The outline that we're using here is first the perplexity of Habakkuk and then the prayer of Habakkuk. And we have finished the perplexity of Habakkuk. But I wanted to read Habakkuk 2.20 before we proceed on. It just was an exclamation point. In the light of his questions and his answers, he says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. In the light of all that was going on, I just want us to see that what he was doing is he was pointing people to the Lord. He was proclaiming the Lord. And that's just a powerful ministry in simplicity for us just to proclaim and to point people to the Lord. And that has led us up to the prayer here of Habakkuk. And that's where we found ourselves in just these recent weeks, him erupting in prayer and praise to God. And just a few things that I wanted to mention here. This so centers on the Lord and His majesty. And what we said that we find here are really three pastoral observations. The first one was His petition in the first two verses, the plea for the Lord. And there's two textual thoughts that were here. One was for divine intervention. And then the second request was for divine mercy. Um, as I thought about this just this morning and jotted this down, what we really have here is from this incredible man, just a, a, a heartfelt cry for two things. One is revival and the second is mercy in the midst of the discipline and what was to come. And that led us to his proclamation, which is an incredible vision of Jehovah. You can just see this common theme. He just keeps moving back and pointing to God in the midst of all that's going on. Two textual thoughts there. The first was the Lord's presence and his power. Just so awesome as he was revealed there. It was really a picture of the glory of his person. And then the second was the Lord's plan. And I like the distinguishing here. It was the greatness of his judicial works integrated together, just recalling the Lord's miraculous redeeming works and preserving and fulfilling his promises. And I just can't stop and just be in awe of God in these opening verses in all of his person and his glory and all of his acts that stemmed out from who he is and all of his character and quality. That leads us to our third and our final expositional observation, which will close us out today in this incredible book. We're going to say it is his praise from verses 17 to 19 
I would add to it, it's really a great hymn of faith. It's an expression of great rejoicing. And this is what he says, if you'll look with me in verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like a deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. And then this closing, to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. These are absolutely incredible verses. Well known to so many, but not necessarily in their context. Dr. David Jeremiah says the last three verses of Habakkuk's prophecy are among the most beautiful expressions of faith in the Bible. They convey a message that God's people in Judah and God's people of every age, and that's us, need to hear Regardless of what happens, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Beloved ones, these are powerful verses of affirmation and declaration of trust and of joy and of praise of the Lord. And there's an amazing spiritual progression that is moved through this book uh, with Habakkuk. He begins with mystery and questioning and wondering and restlessness. But he navigates to certainty, affirming, confidence, worship, rest, and blessing. And I just want to walk through these verses and give us a few biblical highlights here. Look at verse 17 again. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vine. I just want us to note here in verse 17, there's three those. And we just touched on the first one. The next one continues. Though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit. Basically, what he's implying here is in this agricultural community and nation, he's implying agricultural failure and barrenness, devastation of essential crops and foods that were produced in the land. It's implying here a complete crop failure. Or we could say the worst case scenario. Verse 17 has our third though. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd or cattle in the stalls. We can say this is pastoral from the standpoint of sheep and cattle. It's implying they're destroyed. Absolute ruin. And it's causative of an incredible famine. And just step back and think of, of that circumstance or, or what was being perceived could occur with the incoming invasion of the land. Um, it's really referring in one sense to a total economic collapse. The one thing I thought was crucial here is that it seems Habakkuk realizes that inner peace or joy, thanksgiving, rejoicing, it, doesn't it is not determined by outward circumstances. But it's determined by an inner relationship. How many people are looking and, oh, I'll be at peace when this happens or when that happens or if and all those kinds of things. I think we can see a deep, deep spiritual lesson here from Habakkuk that 
the circumstances weren't determining his peace or his joy. Though the Babylonian invasion will awfully devastate the land, Habakkuk would rejoice in the Lord. Look at verse 18. In the light of these circumstances, an important transitional word, yet. Yet, I will rejoice. I will exalt. I will celebrate in the Lord. We have here two I wills. And I will implies what? A choice. I'm making a choice. In light of whatever is, is going on, and as Charlie has so wisely taught us, choices have consequences. So it's so vital to, to think our way through things. And if I choose this, where is it going to go? And as I have told you about my son in Jacksonville, the most positive person I know, he will not choose to think negative things, but to choose the other. And here, amazingly, what he's saying is his focus is on the Lord, not on the devastating circumstances. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a healthy way to live in the spirit and in our soul? And he says that he's choosing to live in devotion. We could even look at maybe the fulfillment of the great commandment to love God with all his heart and to rejoice. But notice what he says here, to rejoice in that important phrase, in the Lord. And we're going to come back to that and see that. But that phrase is so vital. And then he continues in verse 18, and he says another I will, our second, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Jeff Wynell says that the Amplified Bible is the real Bible. So he is going to be speaking here for two weeks, the next two weeks. So if you don't have an Amplified Bible, you might want to go out and buy the real Bible. Uh, per Jeff. How's that for a setup? <laughs> but he's going to be sharing with you guys two incredible encounters the Lord Jesus Christ had. One with Nicodemus and also with uh, the woman at the well. So the, the woman, the word, and so an incredible opportunity. But back to Habakkuk. The Amplified says, I will exalt, and I wanted to read this because of what it says, in the victorious God of my salvation. You see, we have to poise ourselves that way as new creations in Christ. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Nothing can separate us from his love. And so we're living from that life of abundance and victory that we have in him and through him. And he says here that he's going to joy in the God of my salvation. And I love that. It's a repeat of joy. And his joy is in the God. And then I love this, my, which is personal. Do You see all these integrations pulling in? My God. And it's God is my Savior. And I just wanted to make note here, this is really a foreshadowing in one sense of Jesus Christ. Dr. Wood says this, the word salvation is the root from which the name Jesus is derived from Matthew 1, 21. I love these little hidden treasures that God places in the scriptures. And we get to see them as he illuminates us to them. What Habakkuk is saying is, whatever happens to me, I'll praise God, the Lord, who saves me. Isn't that a great declaration? 
whatever happens to me. It's what John Hancock is saying, whatever happens, God is the God of my salvation. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I am secure. I am assured. I am more than a conqueror. I am a victor in Him. And I will choose to rejoice. Not necessarily in the circumstances, but I will rejoice in the Lord who is with me in the circumstances. Dr. Constable says here in quoting another man, the words rejoice and exalt um, are the strongest possible way to say one is determined to rejoice in the Lord, regardless of what happens. And it's implying that faith is going to be expressed in serving God. And literally, this word means I will jump for joy in the Lord. I will spin around for delight. Isn't that incredible? Think of the setting. Think of what's going on. Think what's happening here. Most people would be like Eeyore. Oh, woe is me. Oh, look what's coming. That's the way it is. But what he says is, and I'm going to give you an illustration you won't ever forget. He said, I would jump. I'm going to leap. And I'll spin around. If I never make it back from Florida, you won't ever forget that. <laughs> but get the point. This, the language in the Hebrew, and Charlie's always emphasized that, is so flowery. It is written in such a way that we would just relate to and understand. And that's what Habakkuk's saying. It's not just I'm going to endure. I'm going to leap for joy. I am going to spin around in delight in the salvation that I have in and of God. It's just an expression of incredible victory. Warren Wearsby says that by the time Babylon was through with the land of Judah, there wouldn't be much to value that was even left. Buildings would be destroyed. Treasures would be plundered and farms and orchards would be devastated. The economy would fall apart and there would be little to sing about. But God would still be on his throne. Amen. Working out his divine purposes for his people. Habakkuk couldn't rejoice in his circumstances, but he could rejoice in his God. And his rejoicing here is because of his so great a salvation in God and plans for us such a great foundation for our rejoicing. Verse 19 continues and says, the Lord God, and this really uh, speaks of the sovereign Lord is my strength. This is a powerful, intentional confession, affirmation, and assurance. I hope you can see how he's just building through this. He's erupting volcanically in praise and joy and trust. And he says, Yahweh is the source of my strength. The Lord God is my strength, my personal bravery, and the Amplified says, my invincible army. What a proclamation here. And one man said, security and hope were not based on temporal blessings, but on the Lord himself. And this is the essence, really, in one sense of this book. The just shall live by faith. Beloved ones, if, if we know who Jesus Christ is and His character, and we know His, His faithful works, and we know His love for us, and so many other things and our identification with Him, then we know that He is going to provide us 
with everything that we need to face every circumstance and everything that we come about in our life and our living. I love what the Amplified says about Philippians 4.13. I have strength. And it's really the strength of Christ through the Holy Spirit for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready. And we've mentioned that. I'm ready for anything. And I'm equal to anything through Him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. That should fill us with so much confidence and courage and conviction to run the race that He has set before us with perseverance looking unto Christ and to finish that line unto God's glory. And I don't know how better to say it. You have everything pertaining to life and to godliness. And Jesus Christ is there to empower you, to empower me, to empower us in these days that we are living. It's incredible. And it relates so well. And then... If that's not enough, he says, he will make my feet like a deer's feet. We have two he wills. And the second one is this. He will make me walk on my high heels. The Amplified again. He will make me to walk. Not to stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering, or responsibility. You know, when I read that, I immediately thought of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. What am I going to have want of? Is he not going to provide for me? Uh, How about making me lie down in green pastures. How about his leading and guiding that we sang about today? How about his restoring and refreshing of our souls? How about him leading us in paths of righteousness for his namesake? How about even though we walk through valleys that seem like death, that we choose to fear no evil because we have his presence within us? And we, we know his rod and staff, they, they comfort and protect us. And that he's preparing for us. In the presence of our enemies, anointing our head with oil, our cup overflowing. A place where we're going to be with him forever and ever. And I just could not help but think that possibly Habakkuk thought of that incredible pastoral psalm from David in that time. Habakkuk has learned, one man said, the lesson of faith, to trust God and to trust his providence regardless of the circumstances. He declares that even if God should send suffering and loss, he would rejoice in his Savior God one of the strongest affirmations, it is said, of faith in all of the scriptures. Beloved ones, I believe this was a choice and a decision that he's making before the trouble comes. And I think that's what we need to make. Before the trouble comes, before the things that maybe we don't anticipate come, we make a conscious choice to choose that when they come, we are going to rejoice in the Lord. We are going to manifest the person of Christ. We are going to allow Him to live in and through us in those circumstances. I've told the story to the guys that when Tom Osborne, when they lost the national championship Uh, to Miami in 19, I think it was 83, they scored a touchdown at the end of the game. And 
they were behind by one point. If they kick the extra point, they tie the game, they win the national championship because of how the system worked then. If they went for two, they would win the game and they would have won it, I think, what, I think it was 15, 14 or something like that. Tom Osborne chose to go for two points. And the Christian quarterback who became a senator, I think, he rolled out to the right and he threw a pass and it really wasn't a very good pass. It dropped incomplete. So Nebraska lost the national championship. They asked Tom Osborne afterwards, they said, when did you decide to go for two points? Tom Osborne said, I decided that a week ago, that if we were in this position, that I was going to seek the victory outright. You see, that's forethought. That's decisions. It's fortitude. It's courage. It's all those things. And I think it's the same way for us to make a determination. The Lord Jesus said, if you put your hands to the plow, don't turn back. Or we need to count the cost of, of building this tower, but then you finish it, you fulfill it. And I really believe that Habakkuk is making a decision here because what was yet in the future was what was yet to come. And I believe he rejoiced and walked through it. And what a great encouragement that is to me and to you. We don't know what may be coming, but what we can do is we can control our decisions, right? And we can choose to make a choice to be steadfast and to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Habakkuk, Warren Wearsby says, teaches us to face our doubts and our questions honestly and to take them humbly to the Lord, to wait for his word, to teach us, and then worship him no matter how we feel or what we see. You guys, this to me, this next statement is so important and so powerful. Wearsby says, God doesn't always change the circumstances, but he can change us to meet the circumstances. Isn't that powerful? He may not change those external outward circumstances, but he's busy changing us internally, conforming us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, fulfilling what his ultimate plan and purpose is. That's what I want. I want to ever increasingly be changed and conformed into the likeness of Christ. Circumstances, be as they may. He knows what's best, right? But he's committed. He's committed to making us who are in Christ increasingly like Jesus Christ. Habakkuk closes, and I just wanted to put this little addendum in here uh, because he says to the chief musician, it could be said choir director or conductor, with my stringed instruments. This was, it seems, uh, to be played, to be celebrated in temple worship and possibly on the harp and on the lyre. And this just should give us so much confidence to combat discouragement with our present circumstances and uh, seeing that we can believe God and we can trust Him in all things and in all ways. So that leads us to the conclusion, brrr, the final thought that we have here on this book. And Habakkuk, uh, his doxology, his praise in three, embraced his petition, his proclamation. And one man said the book of Habakkuk builds to a triumphant climax that's reached in these last three verses. And truly, that's what we've done. And so how do we uh, respond? What is our response in... This time, this season, as believers in the church age, as new creations in Jesus Christ, 
How do we respond? Just one point. Rejoice in the Lord. If you are a new creation in Jesus Christ, if you have uh, the presence of Christ living in you, the power of the Holy Spirit, we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And if we progress that through, what do we see? We are ones who the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and joy, right? It's not you working it up. It's Christ and the Holy Spirit flowing it through you. And not only that, what does Paul say? Rejoice in the Lord. And then he says, rejoice in the Lord. And in case you didn't get it, I'm going to say it again. Again, I say, rejoice in the Lord. And then in case it's still missed, in 1 Thessalonians, he says, rejoice always. But you know what's attached to that with some other things? For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. You want to do the will of God this week? Rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what might get thrown at us in so many different ways, choose. Choose through Christ and by His Holy Spirit to rejoice. I wanted to close this section and we'll proceed to celebrating the Lord's table. But I was watching a program and there was a singer and a songwriter who came on and I could see and I could tell that there was physically, you know, some health challenges. And they said some things to this singer-songwriter and they shared a few thoughts. And then this person had written this song and they, they wrote this song and it was incredible and the instrumentation of it and it was about basically their journey. So when the people were talking to them afterwards, what came out, which was what I was anticipating, was this singer who was 30 years old, had terminal cancer, was given a 2% chance of living, and not even sure they would survive the length of uh, this time. And her spirit or her soul was so sweet, there was just something you could tell. Well, as they were questioning this individual, they said, you cannot wait until everything is okay to be happy. That profoundly affected me. We can't wait till everything is perfect and Pollyanna and great for us to choose to rejoice in the Lord. Beloved ones, rejoice. Choose joy. Choose to walk in the Holy Spirit. Choose to be one that others just take notice of. Because you know who God is. You know you're united with Christ. You know your destiny and your legacy. And therefore, no matter what happens, you rejoice. And I'm going to ask the guys to play the song that we open this series with, that blessed be the name of the Lord in whatever circumstances we have. Amen. You can be seated, everybody. My heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. Well, that leads us to just a closing out of a celebration of communion. I always I love to, to do that on these special patriotic, 
patriotic holidays. And I just wanted to, on this Independence Day, call this our Declaration of Dependence. And as we come today, and as you come forward to this table, and you take the cup, and as you uh, receive the bread, see this as a fresh declaration, a declaration of your dependence upon God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Dependence upon the revelation of the Word of God that He has given to us. Dependence upon Him to live in us and through us and fulfill uh, His plans and purposes uh, for us. And I could not help but think of the verse I think that just fits the best here is Galatians 2.20. This is a declaration of Paul of dependence. I have been crucified with Christ. As you come forward, you are declaring your dependence upon him from Romans 6, that you have been crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ. But also you're declaring it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives inside of you inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're justified by grace through faith. But also, and I live in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I'm declaring today that I'm living by faith in the Son of God for justification, for sanctification, for everything I'm living. And then the one who loved me and gave himself for me. So I'm declaring that the Lord Jesus Christ loved me and he willingly, sacrificially gave himself for me so that I would be forgiven of all sin and sins and I would be given his abundant life now and forevermore. I like that as a declaration of dependence. And as you walk up here today, I just want you to envision that you're John Hancock riding at the top, that you're declaring to Jesus Christ, you're absolutely dependent upon him, and you're declaring your love for him. The Apostle Paul tells us, as we would introduce this table in an incredible way, for I've received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you, or given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So before we come, would you just bow your heads and your hearts with me and we'll pray together. And then I'll invite you to come and receive these elements and then we'll partake of them together in just a moment. Eternal Father, today is an incredible day for us as we declare our total, absolute dependence upon the triune God of glory and what you have revealed to us, your desire and your design, and you outworking the indwelling life of Christ, us living by faith and acknowledging Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior and to declare his love for us. And so we thank you that as we come, we ask your richest blessings upon this bread as it symbolizes the breaking of his body for us, given for us, that we would receive the bread of spiritual life and this cup symbolizing his blood that was shed for not only the forgiveness of sins, but his life now living in us and through us. So today, we declare our dependence. On a day that we celebrate our independence as a nation, we declare our dependence upon you, and we celebrate our citizenship, which is in heaven. 
and how we look forward to that day when you come back for us and we will be with you forever. And we pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name, asking you to receive the glory now and forevermore. Amen. So as the music plays and as Buck goes downstairs, you guys just make your way up here and you can go down both sides of the table however you desire. And if you'd be sure and pick up the elements, take them back and then we'll partake of them together. OK, so if you guys would and guys, please come and please come declaring and expressing your love for Jesus Christ. Has everybody been able to get into the top? If anybody needs help, I'll send Pam. Um, is everybody, everybody able to get into the top? So on the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you as often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. So let's eat together in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how we so celebrate today knowing that he is our indwelling life by the power of the Holy Spirit and how we celebrate today even with this cup that we've been cleansed from all sin and sins. How freeing is that? And even on this Independence Day, we really celebrate. We celebrate our freedom spiritually. And because of Christ, because of the cross, because of grace through faith, you guys, we've been set free. Set free from, from the penalty of sin, the power of sin. It's dominating power. One day the very presence of sin. That is something to really celebrate. But as we celebrate it, we declare it's not in and of our own strength. It's in dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you can navigate it, let's all stand together and uh, honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, symbolic of us standing in the name that's above all names. He said that uh, this cup is a new covenant that is uh, in my blood. As often as you drink it, you do this in remembrance of me. And so we drink today. And as we drink, as we said, we await uh, his return for us. And what a day that will be. So let's drink together in Jesus' name. Well, as we get ready to dismiss, I want to thank you guys for all that you mean to me, and I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity and the privilege that you uh, give me to serve you and to love you. And whenever I come to either the table or times I'm going to be away, I never take it for granted of the blessing he's given to me or if I would ever have that opportunity again. So I want to thank you guys. Thank you for your prayers for me, which over this week, as I've seen and heard, have just been absolutely incredible and how they have been effective and fervent for me. So thank you guys so much for that. And as you pray for us as we're away, we'll look forward uh, to, to being back with you. And, and thank you for giving us this time to be renewed, to be refreshed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that said, I just want to tell you I love you. God bless you. Have an incredible Independence Day. And God willing, we'll see you in a few weeks, okay? So we're dismissed, everybody.